I am really happy to be here to, in the Art Philippines, uh, in the fair, to speak about my grandfather's work. And I would like to start doing so in reference to this beautiful painting, this 1974 painting. It's called The Collector. And this has always been a very special painting for me because when I was growing up, we used to visit my grandfather in Pietra Santa, which is a small town in Tuscany, in Italy, that's very famous because uh, it has very important sculpting tradition. That is where Michelangelo took the marble to make his famous David. And that is where my grandfather does his sculptures as well. And so anyway, my grandfather has a house there, a little house there. And in the kitchen, there used to be a poster with this painting. And when I was small, I would used to stand there in front of it and wonder, why is my grandfather so famous? Why, what is it that makes his work uh, famous in Colombia and in the rest of the world? What is it that makes his art significant? And well, this is a question that has always been there kind of in the back of my mind and has led me to many different paths. I think it's a, it has something to do with my passion for art, for literature, for philosophy, which is my field of study. Uh, but in 2016, I had this incredible opportunity to delve in this question very deeply because I was invited by Juan Camilo, who is here with us, to be part of the Botero in China production team. That is to, to help in the production of my grandfather's first official exhibitions in China. And part of my responsibility there were to be present during my grandfather's interviews to make sure that he understood correctly of his well, he's over 80, so sometimes he has trouble hearing, so I had to be there to make sure that he understood the question, that he felt comfortable. So I got to listen to my grandfather speak about his work three or four hours a day, and that is what I want to share with you today. But when, when Juan Camilo asked me to do this lecture, I thought that this was an incredible opportunity for me to do something I had never done which is to learn about Philippine culture and Philippine art, because I believe that we can tell a lot about a country uh, studying its art. So let's talk first about a history of Colombia. When I started my research to do this lecture, I was amazed to learn how many things Colombians and Filipinos have in common. We are two nations that are very, uh, very close culturally to one another, mainly because we were colonized by the same European power. We were both subject to the Spanish crown for more than 300 years. And this, of course, has determined a lot about our culture and our national identity. For instance, it has, uh, it's, it's something that has made our countries predominantly Catholic. And this is something that we see a lot in my grandfather's work, for, for instance, in this beautiful painting called Our Lady of Colombia which is a painting that is almost part of, of a colonial art. It's, it's typically colonial in the, same, in the way that it has the same subject of colonial art everywhere, which is like the, a Virgin Mary, a Madonna levitating uh, in the air with the baby, baby Jesus Christ in her arms. And, um, and what, what I think is most interesting is that each country has appropriated and made colonial art in its own particular way according to its customs, to its people. So for instance, we see that in this painting from uh, Lima, from Peru, and this other painting from uh, Mexico, the, the in de Guadalupe. And of course, we see it in this beautiful painting by the great Filipino colonial artist, Damian Domingo, and this is currently in the Ayala Museum. And in relation to that, I wanted to share an anecdote. Uh, before coming here, the day before I took my flight, uh, to come to the Philippines, I went to visit my grandmother to say goodbye. She's a huge art collector. She loves uh, art, and she especially she loves uh, colonial art. And she told me that she bought a piece uh, in Mexico not too long ago, and that she later found out that it came from the Philippines. And uh, it could be that, that we were both like suggested uh, to this idea, but we thought when we looked closely to it that the features of this beautiful Christ figure look Asiatic, even Filipino. It could be that we were both like thinking that, but I don't know, but I think that it could very well be. And this is also uh, has something to do with um, when the day I came here, I went to the Ayala Museum and I saw a beautiful exhibition about uh, of Fernando Sobel. And in the, one of the walls, there was a quotation that I wanted to share with you because it's very, very relevant to this uh, idea. 
He says, the harmonious fusion of local European and Oriental elements in Philippine colonial statuary is pleasing and interesting in its own right and may well hold the key to a problem that has much concerned students of Philippine art. Is there a thing as Philippine style and if so, what are its characteristics? I have no idea how to answer this question because I don't know, uh, unfortunately, I don't know enough about Philippine art and Philippine uh, characteristics to, to know. But what I do, uh, do, what I do know is that this does apply to my grandfather's work. My grandfather's work has, is very preoccupied in taking traditional religious subjects and doing them in a very Colombian way or even in a very Paisa, very Medellin way. And for instance, this is something that happened very recently when in 2011 he did a series on the Passion of Christ on the Via Crucis and he decided to portray Jesus suffering in the streets of Medellin of his hometown. And for instance, he chose to portray Judas as a drug smuggler as in the style of, of, uh, of the infamous Pablo Escobar. It's an idea that is very symbolic and powerful, I believe, because I think my grandfather was pointing to the idea that drug smugglers, drug dealers, are kind of traitors to our country, to our country in so far as they create situations of violence and chaos. But well, this is something that is beside the point. The thing, uh, what is important here is to know that religion has been uh, a topic that has been uh, present in my grandfather's career throughout his whole life, from the very beginning, as this is a, a very early painting from 1969, to uh, present day. Just recently, he did a series on Catholic saints, which is very beautiful. And this, of course, is, is present in the Filipino uh, tradition. Of course, as we see in these paintings by uh, Fernando Morsolo, the great Carlos Francisco Botón, this fresco, and uh, Vicente, Vicente Mananzala. And it's, what, what I think is interesting and beautiful is the way that each artist puts his own uh, aesthetic convictions, his own style, to appropriate the, the, the religious subject. So, for instance, we see in the Mananzala painting this beautiful piece. In the bottom, there is kind of that cubist uh, exploration, and this, this is very uh, typical of Mananzala's work. The religion has been very important in my grandfather's work, but at, at the beginning, his approach to, to this subject was a bit critical. Not to religion itself, but more to the church as a political institution, because my grandfather said when, I, when he was growing up, the church had a very dominating, uh, asphyxiating presence. Everything had to be to come uh, by the local parish. Everything had to be approved by the bishop. And uh, this is something that, that my grandfather used to say, the local parish is like a, the mayor, and the bishop is like a king in our city. And this is something that we see very clearly in this painting, in which the, the presence of the bishop is kind of overtaking the, the Colombian landscape behind the, in the flags that are put behind. The second subject I want to, sp uh, to speak about is a, a very important idea for my grandfather. My grandfather says that uh, artists usually take a subject what is most familiar, what is most intimate for them, and this is usually the place they grew up in. So that is why uh, my grandfather uh, has decided 90% of his production is about many it's about the hometown, about, about his hometown, the place where he lived the first 19 years of his life. And he has never returned again to live there, but it, it's still in, in very strongly in, in, in his work. For instance, in this painting, my grandfather started it because he wanted, he, it was a technical challenge. He wanted to see if he could do the armor and the, and in the, in the gown of Louis XVI, like uh, the way Louis XVI is represented in many paintings, many Europe, famous European paintings. And he did it, he managed to do it, and then afterwards he said, why don't they put him in Medellin? And it's, a, it's a ridiculous idea, but it's, it's, it's kind of like a reflex, a reaction for him, a natural reflection to use Medellin as a subject. And the reason we know it's Medellin, apart from the architecture, which is very Medellin and very Colombian, is that the person we see behind, uh, behind Louis XVI, is my grandfather's mother, my great-grandmother. And that is the, the, the address that we see above the door frame is the address of my grandfather's house when he was growing up. I wanted to, to talk about this subject. I wanted to use uh, uh, a poem by Neruda, who is uh, my grandfather's favorite poem. He got to meet him once, and uh, it was a very comical encounter. Uh, my grandfather gave him a book uh, uh, with his works, and then Neruda was delighted. He, li he liked my grandfather's work very much. They were having lunch, and then after lunch, my, uh, Neruda decides to take a nap, 
and he said, well, I'm going to sleep with Botero, and he takes the book with him to, 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 the, to the bed. My grandfather was a bit scared at first. <laughs> But, uh, but anyway, uh, uh, Neruda says in relation to the Spanish, the Spanish language and Spanish colonization, he says, what a good language mine is, what a good tongue we netted from the fierce conquistadors. Wherever they went, they raised the land, from the, but from the barbarians, from their boots, their beards, their helmets, their cold shoes, luminous words dropped like pebbles, words that remain here resplendent, our language. We ended up losers, we ended up winners. They took the gold and they left us the gold. They took everything and they left us everything. They left us the words. And I believe that this is uh, something that we also find in one of the great uh, Jose Rizal's poems. For instance, he says, Come down from pleasing light of art and science to the fight. O you and there on time that change that heavy light, your spirit free to flight. See how in flaming song, amid the shadows thrown, the Spaniard's holy hand, a crown resplendent band, proffers to this Indian land. And what I, I believe that what Neruda and Rizal are talking about is how the Spanish, the, the Spanish colonization that took, did a lot of harm in many ways. They practically destroyed the, cult, the, the cultures that were there before them. But in another sense, they left us something amazing, which for Neruda is words, but what he means is poetry. And also, uh, as, as Rizal said, but this incredible crown resplendent band is art and science. And the idea, this European idea of art, that art is universal. That art can touch, can, can move every, anyone, every, anywhere. That art, no matter where it's made, can, can, can have an impact on another person from another part of the globe. And this is something that, that was a very strong idea at the, at the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century when, when we Filipinos and Colombians were gaining our independence and with, along with many other countries that were gaining their independence we realized the importance of our native subject of, of the, the, the subject of our land and this for instance we see in, a sculpt, in two sculptures that are very similar one by a Colombian artist called Romulo Rosso. This is a representation of a, of a chicha, of an indigenous goddess, which is very important for Colombia, and which is very similar for, uh, to the triumph, uh, trium the triumph of science over death by the Rizal. I, this, this guy was a genius. He did everything. It's incredible. But in painting, we see it in the, one of the, the first to realize the importance of this subject was Rivera, right? Rivera to, uh, was one of the first to, to understand that the indigenous culture was incredibly beautiful, and that it had been overlooked, and that it deserved the, the chance to be central to the production. And this, we was, I think that Galo Campo, the, the great Philippine artist, was even before Rivera, and he was incredible in realizing this idea. In 1938, he, he shocked the Philippine uh, society by deciding to make uh, a Virgin Mary and, and a Jesus Christ as, uh, as pre-Columbian Filipinos, right? And this is a very beautiful idea, which I believe has determined uh, a lot of, of the best Filipino paintings that I saw. For, for example, for me, this beautiful uh, Botón it's just an amazing piece. Or uh, Anita Matsai Saipo. Uh, when, when they take the Filipinos as subjects, it, became, it becomes so powerful. And I, as a Colombian, can appreciate it in its full splendor. This, this work is one of the first paintings my grandfather did. He went to uh, a, a small town in the Caribbean coast in Colombia, and he did these beautiful paintings. And with this one, he won the second uh, prize in the national contest when he was just uh, 20 years old. And this is a beautiful painting, which you wouldn't imagine it is my grandfather's, but he was very influenced by, by this uh, like trend. For example, this another work, you wouldn't imagine it's my grandfather's. You, when I saw this work the first time, I thought it was a Rivera. But this is from my grandfather's earlier period. And this, I believe, is the idea of something that I, I heard my grandfather say many times in China in, during his interviews. He says, the language has to be universal because the, paint, the subject in the painting, I think, must be local or, or, or parochial, but the language has to be universal. 
it, because it has to be something that touches any viewer anywhere. Because painting has some elements that are global, that are universal, and that can say something to everyone. And, and as my grandfather developed his career, he realized that it, it, it didn't only have to be indigenous as subject, but also that the main topics of his work are from Paisa life, uh, from Medellin contemporary life. For example, this urban scene, is, is, it, 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 it looks like a, 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 a square anywhere in Colombia. It looks like a typical Colombian square. And uh, this is a painting that we, we brought here with us. Also, this landscape that for me it speaks to me about my great grandfather. My great grandfather was a traveling salesman. He, he used to go uh, with donkeys uh, selling his products before before there were cars in Colombia, of course. And he would, he would go by donkey to different Colombian towns and sell his uh, sell his uh, products, his merchandise. And that is what uh, uh, what the main topic of this painting that we also brought here. It used to be part of my grandfather's uh, private collection, and it's uh, something that he wanted Filipinos to see as Filipinos to see as part of uh, what is his homeland, what is his land. That this, uh, those are typical Colombian mountains. And if, the, if you ever get the chance to go to Colombia, which I hope you will, uh, I think you will recognize immediately this landscape. And sometimes it is something that you that that is indirect or that it's implicit that it's not explicit, but there's something about this woman that screams Colombia to me. I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's her jewels, her dress, the way she looks, but I, I, I just feel I have met this woman in Colombia a thousand times. I have talked to her. I have watched her uh, walk down the street. There's something that speaks to me about that, 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 that it's very, I don't know, it's crazy, but it's, it speaks intimately to me. And this, of course, is something that we also see in the still life. And, 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 and this is a very beautiful idea because by choosing uh, to do a very traditional subject as the still life, but to kind of put it upside down and, and choose tropical fruits, tropical fruits as pineapple, as, as, as plantain, as grapefruit, my grandfather makes it very Colombian. It's something that uh, it, he takes a, a, a subject or a, a topic that is, that's part of the European tradition and he makes it his own. He makes it Colombian. He makes it part, uh, uh, he makes it belong to the colonized, not to the colonized. And I think that this is something that, that we we find also in the Philippine tradition. For example, great, the great Philippine tradition, he takes a very traditional subject, uh, a vendor. It's something that we, uh, or uh, it's something that we see a lot in the European tradition. But by choosing to to, to portray a landscape vendor, he makes it very Philippine or, or southern Asiatic. He takes a a, a, um, a subject that's very traditional and he makes it his own through uh, through the language of art. And this is also we see in Fabian de la Rosa as well, or 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 Amar Soros. Uh, mango gatherers, right? It's something that I, 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 I believe it must speak to you in a very intimate way that I, uh, I, as a Colombian, can appreciate but cannot feel in the same intensity that you feel. Or, for example, we said to Manancelle, like fish are everywhere in the world, but there's a way that he makes this still like with fish that, that it sounds like what it looks to me very Philippine. It's, it felt very Philippine. Uh, or also this uh, beautiful painting by Fabián de la Rosa uh, that uh, if I, I want to say it right, Kundima, Kundima. And, and, and uh, when I when I saw this painting, I immediately wanted to to hear Kundima. I wanted to, to learn about Kundima, and I, I looked at it, uh, I looked for it in YouTube. And what is my surprise when I hear Kundima? It sounds like a Colombian song, a Colombian bolero. And, 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 and again, the similar similarities between our nations so strong. And the proof of it is that I put a Colombian song. This is, a, this is this is what we call bolero in Colombia. It's a very traditional music style, very very and, and especially it's very strong in my grandfather's region. And that sounds so natural to me. That sounds like maybe I'm crazy, but it sounds like the, the guy is playing that piano. And this is this idea that music, that uh, art sometimes comes with a certain soundtrack.
one of my grandfather's most famous subject is dancers. He's very famous for his dancers. My grandfather's work is a result of a continuous dialogue between himself and the great masters of the past, the artists he admires. Actually, he has this beautiful uh, phrase that is, uh, for an artist, the quality of the work you create is a function of who you admire. This in turn defines your influences. This is a fundamental truth of art.